Welcome to Future of Freedom. I'm your host, Scott Bertram. Future of Freedom is a production of America's Talking Network. You can check out all of our great podcasts at americastalking.com. Joining me today is Tony Woodley. He is Executive Vice President at the State Policy Network, helping to oversee SPN operations, supporting SPN's president, and helping to ensure the organization's projects and programs measure success. He previously served as president of the Bill of Rights Institute. Before that, the Market-Based Management Institute, also president of the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. He is also the author of I, Citizen, A Blueprint for Reclaiming American Self-Governance. Tony, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me on, Scott. So what is the State Policy Network? Why does it exist? So this organization, we're coming up on our 30-year anniversary. And uh, very briefly, the, the genesis of the organization was um, uh, President Ronald Reagan, uh, not long after he left office, he mentioned to um, the gentleman who ended up becoming our founder, uh, Tom Rowe, that what the states need, uh, and this is Reagan remembering his time as governor of California, what the states need is something like a heritage foundation in every single state. You know, we had a, like a nexus of thinkers and practitioners, many of whom went into the Reagan administration to help um, clean things up. Uh, so Tom Rowe took him seriously, and that began this organization. So our early years were establishing a little think tank in every state. And over time, some of those became great big think tanks. And then many of them morphed or added on capabilities like investigative journalism, uh, litigation, um, and, and that, that sort of thing. But it all began with that remark from President hmm. Reagan. So what would you say is the mission of State Policy Network and how do you guys execute that mission? So we uh, exist to build up support uh, state-based organizations that are working to, uh, you know, generate better policies in their states and also uh, to work together to restore federalism. You know, constitutional federalism has taken a beating um, since the 30s. And so what we want to do is right the ship. And so the state-based organizations do their own work within their state capitals, working on a variety of policy reforms. But then there are instances where they'll work together on uh, larger policy initiatives. And um, that's our job is to sort of stay in the middle of that and support and uh, provide strategic guidance, fundraising guidance, that kind of stuff. Um, but it's really to help them win, not to do it, but to help them uh, in whatever ways we can. On SPN's website, which is spn.org, there's a list of values for the organization. One is finding local problems being solved by local leaders who know and understand challenges. Why does, why does local leadership and local solutions, why do those lead to better policies? I think for a couple of reasons, Scott. One is, no matter how well you think you understand an issue or, an, or a policy from a sort of a theoretical or textbook standpoint, um, when you really get into a, a, a problem in a community, you see all the little corners and angles and connections that you wouldn't have understood before. Like really quick example, um, our, one of our affiliates, um, you know, allies in Georgia, uh, a state-based group, some of the work they've done is to help uh, support an organization that serves women who are in prison pregnant women who are in prison. So this little organization exists to provide care for and make sure that the, the babies have a home after they're born in prison. And so that, that sounds good. That sounds like something any of us can understand. But only when you get into the details of Georgia do you understand that the head of the Department of Corrections in Georgia uh, doesn't want to work with this group and doesn't want to um, share information with them, which makes it harder for them to help these babies. And so that little detail you only understand once you're in it with local people. If you tried to establish a federal program in Washington that said, we're going to hand out a lot of money to support babies born in prison, you would miss those little details. But if you empower the local leaders, they can deal with that kind of nonsense and craft a better solution. So that's one reason is just knowledge. And the other reason is investment, uh, like emotional, psychic investment in the solution. When the solution is handed to you from higher up the chain, it just means less. You're less invested in it. But when you have to come up with it yourself and bring your neighbors along, 
in the democratic process, you're all more invested by the time you're done. Because you're working with neighbors and people you see on an everyday basis or every week basis in local politics, does it make for a more uh, does it make for a calmer brand of politics, a, a more collegial brand of politics than that of perhaps at even the state or or, or national level? Uh, you know, I, Scott, I think it depends on the issue. You know, John Courtney Murray uh, said that in, in a democracy, we are locked together in disagreement, that this is the natural state of things in a well-functioning democracy. So we we are jostling, arguing, persuading, cajoling. That's how local democracy is supposed to work. So that would mean sometimes tempers can rise, um, but you don't have the sort of winner-take-all investment that you see with national politics in part because you are dealing with your neighbor. Like one thing we saw, um, just looking at all the, you know, uh, school board, you know, uh, fracases around the country, you know, parents are angry, understandably, they're showing up to yell at the school board members. And, Mm -hmm. you know, some of that stuff goes viral. What you saw, what I saw in North Carolina, for example, we did a little research, is that the most contentious uh, school board meetings, we had to bring in the police and, and, and there were fist fights and stuff. It was when people who didn't even have children in the school system were showing up in, inflamed by kind of national tribal politics like the, on the left and the right. And when they got them out of there, even though you still have parents who disagree about critical race theory or whatever else, the, the temperature went down. Mm-hmm. So that kind of thing tells me that, yes, over time, as long as you have that democratic functioning where people can speak their peace and look their neighbor in the eye, you'll lower the temper- temperature. But when you have sort of a tribal affiliation, you no longer see a neighbor, you see an enemy. Talking with Tony Woodleaf, who is Executive Vice President of State Policy Network, SPN.org. Another value of SPN is free enterprise. Free enterprise is the most moral and proven system to build business and livelihood, says SPN. Uh, that sounds great for, for me, for you, for the individual. What does free enterprise do for the local community? What good is it? Well, so free enterprise, um, you know, first of all, I'll note that uh, a lot of these surveys where, you you know, the surveys tell us that all the millennials are becoming socialists. Um, (laughs) The pollster, Scott Rasmussen, who's just awesome, he uh, he surveys uh, the same millennials and you'll ask them, hey, do you like socialism? And they'll say, yeah. And then the very next question, hey, what do you think of free enterprise? And most of them will say, yeah, that's awesome, too. (laughs) Uh, So the idea that, um, you know, you you have property rights and uh, you can sort out, you know, w- what your neighbors need, you know, what you need from them and you can exchange in that local economy. It, it creates bonds uh, between people, you know, when they're engaged in trade and exchange and all that, that I think you lose, right, when you begin to centrally administer, when a community has, when the people in the community own these resources and can trade with each other, you're more likely to get a solution that works for most people than when you try to administer it um, from the outside. The final value is that nonprofit think tanks play a vital role in society. And I might hear some people chuckle at that assertion. (laughs) Why is it important to have think tanks, these groups of people who sit around thinking, analyzing, and considering policy? You want to be thoughtful about policy in part, but getting back to what we just talked about, there's a local element you have to understand. You can't just walk around with, you know, your Milton Friedman textbook and think that you have all the answers to everything. There's always a local application. Um, and understanding the problem requires that kind of analysis and thoughtfulness and community engagement. So, you know, the think tank term, uh, more and more, I think, golly, we need some other term because <laughs> the most, uh, you know, the best think tanks that I know of they're engaged in their communities, so they're they're keeping a dialogue going with people who are suffering under the the policies that these think tanks want to change, and they've got a dialogue with policymakers. So they're more like a hub of conversation and problem solving, engaging lots of people. And that, to me, is uh, maybe we need a different term than that because the groups that isolate and you get some smart guys in a room with their textbooks, they never get anything done. It's the ones that are engaged in their communities. They get stuff done. Um, and then over time, they build other capabilities. Like a lot of them have had to build litigation centers mm-hmm. because, you know, you've got government officials who don't want to be forthcoming with the data. And so you, sometimes you got to sue them, right? Um, or you got to sue them to obey the law. And then you need investigative journalism because, you know, we've seen a destruction of local news media 
And so they've got to go directly to their customers, the you know taxpayers of the state with data and information. So I think maybe we need a different term. Maybe it's a, a conversation tank or a <laughs> debate tank. I, I don't know. Many times when uh, potential policies are being considered by, by government, uh, the, the projections, the consequences are also outlined by those same government actors. And perhaps there are projections by government agencies that make the budget numbers look a little rosier than they could be. D- do you see one of the roles of these state policy networks across the country to look at these policies from a, from a, from a public, from a taxpayer point of view and lay out the potential consequences? Uh, but that's exactly it. And years and years ago, you know, when I was with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, um, some smart people there began a regulatory studies program with precisely that idea in mind, that you, you, you have interested parties that are coming to the table to try to get uh, rules and regulations passed. And th- those interested parties are the bureaucrats themselves. And, and it doesn't mean they're nefarious. It's just they have a strong point of view. In fact, when you look at uh, public comments, which are required by federal law, when a federal agency wants to make some kind of regulatory change, they have to open up and receive comments from people on what the people think those changes will entail. Um, a, a large portion of those comments are often from other federal agencies and people within the federal agency that's proposing the rule change. Mm-hmm. So they're right there at the table trying to influence things. And their data isn't always the best. In fact, quite often they hide data. They mislead. they numerous examples you know students of um, federal bureaucracy could talk all day about examples of federal agencies deliberately misleading congress and the taxpayers um, with their data the state policy network organizations all are nonpartisan. when you consider what we've discussed thus far today free enterprise local decentralization of decision making a lot of those issues and topics are, are going to come on the right side of the political aisle what does it mean for you, for these organizations, to be nonpartisan? And, and have you and SPN organizations found success working with those on the left who might be in some ways unnatural allies on some issues? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, for nonpartisan, I think, is essential because a danger we have with ideology and with political tribalism is that it distorts uh, a person's ability to reason and see the facts. So what we know without question is that people who are the most staunchly in favor of uh, a political party are also the easiest to uh, mislead, who are the quickest to misread economic information, for example, um, so that it, it, they, they view it as rosier when their guy is in the White House and more awful when their guy is out of the White House. So partisans um, misperceive. And so you need a nonpartisan approach, uh, like a parallel lane to politics that's engaged in politics, but divorced from the political tribalism. And so that's what we've been we've been building. And so working with folks on the left, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity to do that. Just for example, um, we began a large donor privacy effort because what we saw in a lot of states was that politicians on both sides of the aisle would craft these laws to allow them to find out, well, who's funding that, you know, that website or that think tank that's criticizing me? I want to know who the donors are. Well, we know why they want to know, Mm -hmm. right? So they can then punish them. In fact, there was a Supreme Court case about that, protecting the NAACP and their donors from the state of Alabama many, many years ago. So we found on that issue, like the National Association of Black Journalists, the ACLU, before they went completely crazy, uh, (laughs) um, they were allies on this. And a lot of Democrats were. And you see it on things like occupational licensing which very often, as our friends at the Institute for Justice have found, very often those kinds of laws penalize minorities and the poor uh, to and favor people who are better off. So we find allies among Democrats on that, on things like uh, hospital reform. Unfortunately, our Republican friends sometimes don't want to get into that, mm-hmm. uh, but the Democrats do. So you've got to be like divorced from politics, really uh, above it, away from it if you want to have a a long-lasting effect for people versus a political tribe. We hear at times, Tony, these days that Congress in Washington, uh, federal Congress, our Congress, doesn't do any work anymore. They don't do the work of legislating. They leave that job to either the the court or they leave it to administrators uh, in Washington to do that work. 
Do we have a similar set of problems at the state level where you're trying to make, and SPN is trying to make these differences? Do state legislatures still do the work? That is such an important question, Scott. We see a tendency in state legislatures to want to do to themselves what Republicans and Democrats did to Congress, which was practically destroy it in the 80s and especially 90s and the aughts. Um, The good news is uh, those kind of extreme factions at the state level are smaller and less influential. And you have state legislatures that have, at least for now, a set of operating rules that tend to promote debate and compromise the, the kinds of rules that Congress destroyed. It, you know, states, they, they have to pass a balanced budget, right, for the more or less. They have sleight of hand. But <laughs> there are some rules of the game yeah. that promote comedy, even though we know that uh, – there's plenty of data that state legislatures are just as polarized as Congress, you know, Republicans and Democrats apart from each other. They're just as polarized, but they get a lot more done. They, they pass a substantially greater percentage of bills uh, than Congress does. Uh, that, that's not always good, right? Some laws are terrible, Mm -hmm. but um, the danger is that people like political entrepreneurs at the state level could uh, think that maybe they want to become like, you know, people in Congress, Congress and shut down the ability of the other side to have debate, uh, give the party leaders more control over what committees can do and can't do. And once you start doing that, you really go down a very dangerous path, in my opinion. How do you convince voters and citizens to care deeply about what's happening locally and on the state level when that spotlight is so bright on D.C. and on federal policy? We, We know local media is in decline for a number of reasons. Uh, People turn to social media, Facebook feeds. That's a lot of national information. That's where people want to debate even what's happening in Washington at all times, at all hours of the day. Mm -hmm. How do you get them to concentrate and focus on those issues that are much closer to them? Uh, uh, I love these questions. Like What I recommend is get a local paper. It doesn't matter how good or bad. Just get one. Start consuming that local news it is still there it is still there and it's still mostly focused on what goes on in your city council and that kind of thing it's thin but it's still there so get a variety of sources left right center websites as well go to your city council meeting once in a while take your kids watch a a trial so there are things we can do to re-engage and be observant about what's going on in our communities and then our attention is less on the the dc picture what's going on there. I mean, you, your, your eyes will consume something. So redirect them back towards your community. Um, and then you'll start to notice how these kind of national forces and national politics try to come in and impinge on local decisions. And that maybe will begin to make you angry because, uh, and it comes from the left and the right. People who don't live in your community are trying to exert influence over your community decisions. They do it with their political money. They do it with their you know, federal power. And so paying attention to local, I think, reorients you towards what's going on at the national level, uh, which is important because it's what's going on there. Their effort to control what we do in our communities is, in my view, the threat, not Republican versus Democrat. It's D.C., the imperial city, trying to exert control over our communities. You wrote a book called I, Citizen, A Blueprint for Reclaiming American Self-Governance and discussing the restoration of individual rights and local governance. Is that uh, uh, devolving of power, returning power back to the states, or states just simply reclaiming that power and saying, yes, we, we can do these things? Is that, a, is that a key to conservatism's future? I think it has to be. I think there's a, a dangerous... And a disappointing thread among conservatives, many of whom are, I consider friends, uh, who look at national power and it's kind of like, you know, the the Lord of the Rings, you know, we have this power, (laughs) we could use it for good, you know, and and I'm like Frodo Baggins saying, no, throw it in the fire, you don't know what you're doing. Uh, But they want to use national power to compel their vision of conservatism and morality. And uh, I think that they, they forget the words of Lord Acton it, it, you know, everybody has a view of conservatism, what it means. But my sense of it is that you 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 empower people in their communities to govern their own lives according to a set of traditions and values that they share. And that is the essence of conservatism. And, and you can't do that from D.C. 
that has to be within communities, which means you have to give people authority in their communities so they engage and do that hard work of self-governance. You also wrote a piece over at Real Clear Books uh, titled America Doesn't Need to Argue Less, It Needs to Argue Better. Uh, and you say inside, uh, the pursuits of our two major parties are shaped by their activists and donors, not the will of the American people. H- how can that be true? If if true, wouldn't the American people turn out those people who are not representing their will, not representing their values? Or if it is true, why don't people turn out those who are not representing their values or beliefs? That That's a, a great question. Now, some of it's going to roll up into the reality that... Um, in our system of elections, um, popularly called first past the post, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's not proportional representation. It's winner take all in a district. Um, mathematically, uh, that always pushes you towards two major parties for a variety of reasons. Now, it ought to also push you towards centrism or moderation, right? Because if one party drifts too far from the center, the other party will get in there and gobble up those extra votes and have a majority until the first party, um, you know, reforms itself. That is a tendency. But what's happened in the case of these parties, long history, to me, it's fascinating. I'm a political scientist, um, but I won't get into it. (laughs) All the way back to the 60s and 70s, a set of national party reforms that kind of undermined the sort of democratic inputs into those parties' decisions, empowered a set of elites on both sides, and especially their donors and activists, so that all their incentives are to please those people. And so that means for you, the voter, at the, the ballot box, you're going to mostly have two choices, two competitive choices, and they're both pretty extreme. So neither party is shifting internally to come back to the middle. In fact, they don't even see the middle anymore, right? So what you hear when Republicans get turned out of office is, oh, well, you know, we just did uh, the people. We didn't get our message out, right? Democrats, the same thing. Oh, we just haven't given the message out, right? Uh, which is what their consultants tell them. So there's a whole center just waiting for someone to come back to it. And and we see it especially in the fact that a majority of Americans now have divorced themselves from both parties. They say they're independent. There's a lot of political scientists who will tell you they're lying. <laughs> I think there's ample data to show that they're not lying. They do vote independently. So there's a, just a, it's a, a bonanza waiting for a party or a politician to reap it. Tony Woodleaf is with us, Executive Vice President at the State Policy Network, uh, SPN.org, here on the Future of Freedom podcast. Uh, these these organizations and states across the country, we haven't talked about them sort of individually yet. Are, are there higher profile uh, organizations in these states that people might be aware of, might have heard of? And where have we seen, where have you seen, uh, real success at the state level through work by these organizations? There's some you may not have heard of, but you've heard of what they accomplished. For example, um, we all know about uh, uh, what I consider just a terrible governor um, in in New York, Cuomo, Andrew Cuomo. Uh, What precipitated him being brought down as he deserved to be was a deep investigation by um, one of our allies in New York, the Empire Center. And they did the FOIAs. They put the numbers together to show the excess deaths in nursing homes where Cuomo pushed COVID positive patients, you know, back into those communities. He claimed that it was federal policy making him do it. That was simply a lie. Then he covered up the data. But that all began with the Empire Center, even though a lot of people haven't heard of them. Uh, In in Illinois, the Illinois Policy Institute, um, they brought down the most corrupt uh, (laughs) state legislator in the history of Illinois, the, the former speaker of the House there, And it was just their investigative work and a lot of great media and the ability to go directly to voters with the media to not depend on the established newspapers that were afraid of this guy. Um, So there's groups like that. You've got Goldwater Institute in Arizona that they've pushed things like right to try, which is a, you know, compassionate um, reform that allows people who are terminally ill to access uh, experimental medicines without waiting for FDA approval and that kind of thing. So there's a lot of, um, Groups like that, that even if you haven't heard of them, you might have heard of what they're accomplishing. So I could go on with (laughs) it. There's plenty of groups like that. They're just, uh, they're getting stuff done. 
What's next? Uh, what's in the future for some of these state organizations? This is uh, not, not a top-down organization. SPN is not, so you're not necessarily telling them what to do. But where right. do you see these frontiers that they are addressing and, and focusing on in their states? Well, so you uh, over the past few years, we saw uh, several of those groups participate in um, a series of court cases that culminated with the Janus decision before the Supreme Court four years ago yesterday that uh, essentially affirmed the right of public employees to exit their union if they don't feel that the union represents their interests. And the reason that was important to our groups is for a lot of the reforms they're pushing, especially education reform, which for our groups is the number one issue. If you don't fix the schools, you're not going to fix anything else. The biggest obstacle has unfortunately been teachers' unions. Uh, Often they don't really represent the true interests of the teachers they claim to represent. They certainly don't represent the interests of the parents or the children. So what our groups realized is if you don't get that kind of union financing reform, uh, you're not going to get education reform. So since Janus, you've had hundreds of thousands of uh, public employee unions, many of them teachers say, you know what, I don't want to be in this union anymore. That means the teachers' unions don't have as much economic power to oppose education reform. So now, especially after COVID and people seeing uh, the what goes on in their schools, you have this momentous opportunity in state after state to get genuine reform, to put parents back in charge of schools, get parents on school boards. And that is a number one issue for, for most of our groups. So that, to me, is a big one. The, a related one is going to be uh, pushed back against federal overreach. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we've reached a point where presidents from both parties think they can just uh, rule like kings and and wait for a court to defy them or stop them. And uh, there's a lot states can do to push back against that kind of um, agency bullying. And so we're hoping to build out that coalition. Tony Woodleaf, Executive Vice President at the State Policy Network. He's also author of I, Citizen, A Blueprint for Reclaiming American Self-Governance. You can find out more about the State Policy Network at spn.org. Tony, thank you so much for joining us here on the Future of Freedom podcast. Thanks, Scott. I enjoyed it. I'm Scott Bertram. For more episodes of Future of Freedom or for other fine podcasts from the America's Talking Network, go to americastalking.com or search wherever you find your podcasts. Thank you for listening to Future of Freedom, a production of America's Talking Network.